everybody. I'm Anita Walker at the Mass Cultural Council and welcome to our very first culture chat. Tough times for our field, tough times for everybody in Massachusetts and across the country. And I know that all of us are at home, um, some of us juggling kids and family and distractions and disruptions, um, still trying to do the work, still trying to make sure that our organizations and our work continues, uh, even in the face of these gloomy times. So we wanted these chats to be just a little bright spot during the day, just a little example of how resilient our field is, how imaginative the people who work in our field are, how much energy we all still have, even though sometimes we feel a little bit tired at home. And we are going to be sharing great ideas, creative efforts, and hopefully a little sunshine, even on the cloudy days here at our culture chats. We're going to have them at one o'clock, a couple times a week. I don't know which days, whatever days we can get people to join us. Um, we are glad you are joining us today. And um, please feel free to submit any questions that come up during the course of our conversation. Now, when we thought about doing this, I thought we need to get guests on who are full of energy, full of spirit, full of can-do-ism, and I couldn't think of anybody more full of all those things than Terry Wilkowitz, who actually we had booked to do a presentation at our cultural council meeting um, in March in Fall River, and unfortunately, due to the coronavirus, we had to cancel that meeting. Um, Terry has been on the podcast with me, Creative Minds Out Loud, and I've been working in this field for honestly, 30 years. And I've never had anybody explain arts integration to me <laughs> more vividly and in a way that I could really understand it than Terry did. And not only does she, is she a master practitioner of arts integration in the schools, but she has on a dime pivoted and managed to turn her work into something that can be available and accessible to kids that she's not getting to see because the schools are closed. And I think a lot of stay-at-home new homeschooling parents that are out there. Um, bear with us. I've never done these before. So, you know, we may have a couple hiccups along the way, um, but we'll get through this together like we're doing everything else. But at this point, I'd like to introduce Terry. If you have not met her, Terry, thank you so much. When I called, you said, sure, I'll do it. I said, I wonder if you're doing anything new and interesting. You said, of course I am. So I'd kind of like to start the conversation with the way we started at um, Creative Minds Out Loud. Tell us about arts integration. What is it really? Well, arts integration uh, is a great opportunity for the arts to find authentic connections to other subject areas, to kind of um, allow children to have a deeper understanding of a subject or a concept and, and kind of break free of the boundaries that we all experienced in school when we moved from classroom to classroom, learning different subject areas in isolation of each other. So arts integration allows us to break down those boundaries and kind of explore concepts in the way that they really exist in the world around us. Um, so there's different types of arts integration practices. Um, and my, my concern um, when I first started working in arts integration uh, back in the 1980s, um, uh, the, a lot of the arts teachers, music and art teachers were feeling uh, a, a little bit used. They felt that the music and arts were being used to serve the learning in other subject areas while not really achieving authentic outcomes of their own. Uh, and there was a little bit of a pushback. So with different types of arts integration, I fell in love with concept-based arts integration because I feel it provides an opportunity for all connecting subject areas, including the arts, to meet on a level playing field with, with all subject areas uh, strengthening and supporting each other without one being used to serve the learning in other academic subjects. Well, so for example, what you're saying is, uh, rather than saying, how can music help us learn math? How can music help us learn science? Um, it's really sort of a duality. You're learning both together. Both are of equal value. Correct. I mean, there's a lot of arts integration practices like uh, you know, the, the teachers learning about teaching their students about the dinosaurs and says, can we sing a song about the dinosaurs? And it's really a fun activity for the kids, but they're, they're not really learning anything about music. And, and same thing with in, the, in art, um, students who are asked to make a, a poster about the water cycle. And they, the teacher feels that they're using arts integration practice to, to put arts into the science curriculum. But the 
teacher is most likely only assessing that poster for the science elements and not really examining the use of art elements uh, in the way that the poster was designed. So that, that's a case that what we're talking about were kind of uneven uh, benefits for the academic subject and, and the arts. Now in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to show how you've taken your school-based program and turned it into something that could be useful now. But before we do that, um, you have really had some creative applications of this concept. Talk about some of the things you've done in classrooms. Um, sure, so um, I think probably one of my favorite programs uh, was a few years ago, we did Gravity in Space and Sound. Um, I'm a musician. I, I understand how music is constructed. I'm not a science teacher, so I have to basically go and figure out the science. And often I start with the curriculum at the elementary school level to figure it out. Um, but for example, the, the idea of connecting the way that planets um, orbit uh, in space and connecting that to uh, chord cycles in classical music and then ex examining how varying degrees of pull between a chord back to the tonic and varying lengths of chord cycles in music can actually provide a representation of how planets orbit the sun within our, old sol our own solar system. So for example, for Mercury, this, it's closest to the sun. It feels the strongest gravitational pull being so close to the sun's massive curvature of space-time. So we played a piece by Mozart that had really quick chord cycles using chords that had a strong pull to resolve back to the home chord or the tonic. And by the time we got out to Neptune, a, a, a planet that has a very long uh, orbit, uh, does not feel a lot of gravitational pull from the sun, we went to a piece by Shostakovich that had a very long chord cycle. I think it was like 13 chords in each cycle all of chords that really didn't have a strong pull to resolve. So the children in the end were able to listen to a chord cycle and then say, oh, that sounds, that's, that's Mercury or that's Neptune. And that idea of building that understanding that goes beyond just the science representation, but allowing music to, to help create a much deeper understanding um, of, of what gravity really means. Tell the example of um, the horses and the galloping <laughs> that one really hit home with me. <laughs> so this year, um, I was struck by, um, I was walking uh, uh, Rusty, and um, Rusty was walking through a muddy section of the park, and I was watching him, kind of upset that he was going to track all that back into my home. And at that moment, he went from walking to moving twice as fast. Now, I now know that's called a trot, from a walk to a trot. And when I looked down at the ground in the mud, the moment he started moving twice as fast, his tracks had completely changed. And I stood there kind of shocked, realizing, now as a musician, I learned that rhythm was represented with dots and stems, and if you color in a note, it, it takes less time. But then I realized there's another way that we can represent rhythm in how it, it really exists in the natural world. These tracks that are left by quadrupeds and all their different gates create these rhythmic figures that are just everywhere in classical music. So what we did is we isolated each of the quadruped gates, walk, trot, canter, half bound, full bound, transverse gallop, and then we played classical music that had the same rhythmic figures. And instead of not just show, we showed them not just with rhythmic notation, but we showed them in track patterns. So now when a child is out and they're in the woods and they see some tracks, those tracks can tell us what kind of animal made the track. Um, how the animal was moving or its gait, but then also what rhythm did its limb strikes create as it moved across the surface? And we can hear that those rhythms exist in classical music. So tell the one, da -da 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 I'm not a singer, folks. I'm just, you know, trying to bring us along on this. <laughs> okay, so I grew up with that ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, bum bum from William <laughs> Tell. Um, it was the opening to the Lone Ranger, right? So I always thought that that was the rhythm of a gallop. And then I was surprised to find out that and that's not a gallop, okay? Horses have four legs, not three, okay? So that is actually the rhythm for what's called a half bound. Rabbits, squirrels, rodents use this where their front two limbs hit separately and then the rear limbs push them off together. So it creates a ba-da-bump, ba-da-bump, 
bump, bada bump. So William Tell is not a horse. It's not a horse. <laughs> it's a rabbit, and it's in a half-bound gait. How did the kids respond? I mean, how did the kids come away from uh, this approach to learning? Um, we get a lot of uh, responses from the kids that uh, they, they get very excited about being able to see these connections that, that relate to their, their real lives. And I think that that's what's exciting for us to bring classical music out of from this special place that you only see in the concert hall, but that it, it connects to everything around us. Um, I also think that, you know, we are here in New Bedford and we have a lot of students where English is not their uh, first language. And by providing different forms of representation, symbol systems, besides only teaching with the written and spoken word, we're kind of opening up other avenues for them to create an understanding. Um, and and I, I kind of saw this uh, with the tracking rhythms. I was in a classroom and we were, we had this giant mat that had all these animal tracks and they were measuring to determine how the animals were moving and, and what story happened between this fox and a rabbit. And one student I noticed was not engaged in, in the activity at all. And it's, it's really fun. So I was surprised. Um, but then I came to find out that the, the student had just arrived uh, in our country and did not speak English. And I, it, I kind of was sad to see that. But then when we moved to the second part of the lesson where they were now performing these rhythmic gates on their tap and track boards, I didn't have to say anything to teach that part of the lesson. It was listening, it was imitating the limb strikes on their board and the rhythms. And he just, his face, just the biggest smile. And he was so excited to be able to participate and learn even though uh, language was a barrier. Um, so I think that that's, a, that's, that's really important that we're able to engage students not with just written and spoken word, but to provide multiple representations. Um, and I, I get a lot of responses from classroom teachers too, because you know a lot of them send their kids off to music and art, right? And they're not there. And a lot of them will view it as it's, it's a break. It's, it's a chance for them to have some fun. And they're just not aware that these, these same concepts that they're teaching in their classroom exist in the arts. And that the biggest compliment I get is that without exploring these concepts uh, in music and art, that, that their, their understanding would be incomplete. And you've actually done some at least early studying about the impact of this approach in two different classrooms, right? We actually did a two-year study uh, thanks to a grant from the League of American Orchestras and the Getty Foundation. And um, we, we, uh, this year we assessed nine schools. Um, and what was interesting, this year we were able to have a control group, which I didn't think was possible because it doesn't seem fair to give some kids something and then another kids don't get it. So we, we found a clever way. We, um, we had a, uh, some schools that I went in and taught just the science aspect of the curriculum for the tracking rhythms, quadruped rhythms, I mean, quadruped gates, understanding how they move, every part of the science curriculum. But I never talked about music or sound, and we pre and post tested them before and after those lessons. And then we looked at the students who had the music integrated with that exploration and gave them pre and post test. Just to be kind, the students who had the science only, after I post tested them, they went through and had the whole program. So they didn't miss out on anything. But so interesting. Um, if we just talk about, uh, we wanna talk to our science teachers, students who had science and music heavily outscored uh, on the science questions for students who only had the science instruction. And I was the same teacher for both. I had just as much fun teaching both science only and science and music, but it really shows uh, the importance of the arts to build deep and flexible understandings. So now the schools are closed and now you're not able to go in with your curriculum and have all that fun you've been having with the kids. Um, and you decided, well, I'm still gonna make this material available to them. So talk about what you did, how you did it, and, and we're gonna see a little example in a minute too. So yeah, I was really bummed out to go from seeing kids every day to not seeing them at all. Um, and you know, for a few days I tried you know, cooking, but 
that didn't really work out. <laughs> didn't work out for anybody, including my family. So I, I really wanted to try to find a way to engage them. So I decided to, to create a video, free online video series. And I didn't know whether we were gonna be restarting. So I didn't wanna go into the current curriculum that I was working with. So I thought, let's, let's pick something completely different and new that they haven't explored with us. And maybe I can create um, online videos that can explore this concept in the way that we do in learning in concert, which is across disciplines, across domains. Um, so I thought about um, the concept of symmetry. Um, I thought about connecting the idea of symmetry in geometry and shapes and imagery in art um, with symmetry in classical music. And so I divided the video series into uh, three parts, flip symmetry, mirror symmetry, and slide symmetry. And in each one, I basically did the, what we did in our programs. Um, visual representations play an important role in learning in concert. Um, we use visual representations uh, uh, for two reasons. Number one, it helps us while they're listening to a musical performance to direct their listening to perceive a specific element that we are exploring in the program. And two, it allows us to use multiple representations, connecting the sounds that they're hearing to the cross-domain context and applications. So I went online and I started with, um, I use a few programs. I use Keynote to create the slides. I use QuickTime to take a screen recording of the animation of those slides. I use GarageBand to create the musical examples and then iMovie to put them all together. Now, hold on a minute. Had you ever done this before? Is, is this just sort of like real-time learning for you? I have um, I've played around with this a little bit in the past before I would go out in the program and I, I used the visual aspects of the, the PowerPoint of Keynote in our assemblies and our concerts. I would try to make a screen recording and put music so I can kind of sit back and say, is this really representing what they're hearing, what the music is doing. So it's kind of been for my own use, um, but now I realize that I can share this and, and it creates a, a visual uh, lesson that pulls together everything in the program. And, and then I really wanted, I tried to, instead of getting, I was pretty depressed to be away from the kids, but I tried to see this as an opportunity. Um, we work with a lot of children, 58 schools, and they know us, they love us, they, they I, I, have no, I know that our kids are heavily engaged with this program. But because we do this during school time, I, I realized that we really don't have an opportunity to engage their families, um, their friends. So I tried to think of this video series as an opportunity not just to reconnect with our students, but to provide an opportunity for me to broaden the scope of, of what is learning in concert and allow families and friends and relatives to experience it as, as well. And as a way for parents who are newly homeschooling, um, I'm just trying to help you out. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna see an example of this. And remember folks, we're doing this for the first time. We did a, one little practice rehearsal. It worked. So um, I'm going to mute my mic. And Terry, you show us the video. OK, this is just an excerpt from, I think it's the second video in the, the symmetry series where we explore mirror symmetry. So I have a few clips for you. OK, let me pull this down, get out of your way. Here we go. Hi, my name is Terry and welcome to the second video lesson on symmetry in shapes and symmetry in classical music. In our last lesson, we explored slide symmetry in shapes and Mozart's piano sonata in C major. Today, we're gonna to explore mirror symmetry. We can find mirror symmetry all around us. Let's start with mirror symmetry in architecture. Here is the Taj Mahal located in India. We can see mirror symmetry in this structure. First, one shape over on this side and another shape of equal size and measurement 
reflected on this side. If we remove the picture and explore these two shapes, we can see how both symmetrical shapes are facing in opposite directions. Now let's see mirror symmetry in this butterfly. If we draw a line of symmetry down the middle of the butterfly, we can see that it is made up of two shapes that are the same size, same shape, and same measurement. However, with mirror symmetry, the shapes are facing in opposite directions. We can hear mirror symmetry in music too. Let's start with the same four note melody from our first video. In slide symmetry, we heard the same shape repeated over and over again, sliding up to higher notes. With mirror symmetry, the second melody is played backwards to create a mirror reflection. The shapes resemble the mirror symmetry in our butterfly. Let's listen to mirror symmetry. piece we will hear mirror symmetry in Haydn's symphony number 47. Here is Haydn's melody. To create mirror symmetry, Haydn plays the exact same notes but in the opposite direction. The melody plays forward and then exactly backwards. The shape of the melody looks like mountains. Here we can see the mirror symmetry of the mountain shapes. Maybe we need a mountain goat too. Yeah, that's better. Let's listen as Haydn creates mirror symmetry. Okay, that was just a, that was a quick uh, clip from that. That was amazing. That was amazing. That was not easy to do. Um, okay, well, it, I actually thought I would do like one of these videos a week, but um, that took me a day. <laughs> Only a day. That's stunning. Yeah, it doesn't take, it didn't take me long. So then, so it ended up instead of like a few weeks, I thought I'd give myself a few weeks worth of work with three videos. Uh, it was three days. So all three, the three videos are completed. We're, we're waiting to do the fourth video where we're going to do a live stream performance with the trio of musicians that goes into the schools for learning in concert. So um, uh, one of my musicians, his shoulders having a little bit of a problem. So as soon as he's feeling better, we're going to do a, a, a live stream so that the kids can get the final uh, video in this series with a visit uh, with their favorite musicians. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Um, to our um, people who are joining us on the chat, please know that you can um, send us a question. Just push the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen if you have some questions for Terry about how she did this or um, anything about arts integration in general. But meantime, Terry, so is this work you have done, is this available to all? How can people take advantage of it? How can those parents at home with their kids today say, kids, we're going to learn about Mirror symmetry today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have um, all three of the symmetry videos on the New Bedford Symphony Orchestra YouTube channel. So you can just go onto our YouTube channel and all the videos are right there. You can watch them in a row or take some time. Um, and then there, um, also I wanted to mention that the, uh, the orchestra is, uh, besides the education outreach, um, we've been, we're doing live stream concerts with our musicians in small groups. Um, Last week, we had a fiddle concert um, with uh, two of our musicians. And wow, what, what a success. We had, I think we had more views and more shares on this uh, live stream concert than we've seen before. And it seemed to travel all across the country. And I think that people 
in, in their homes are looking for opportunities um, to just lift their spirits. So we uh, put out a call to all our musicians since we are not able to perform in our concert hall. And we asked them, if you have a, a duo or a trio and you'd like to do a live stream concert, we're in. And so I think we have, we have six of these um, that are scheduled. Um, you could get them, see them on the uh, New Bedford Symphony Orchestra Facebook page. Even after live stream, they can access them. And I, I have to give a plug because tomorrow night, I'm so excited. Tomorrow night, our music director, Yaniv Dinor, is going to give a live stream uh, piano concert on our uh, Facebook Live. So really, really excited. I, I can't wait to tune in for that one. So, you know, they say um, necessity is the mother of invention. And necessity really led to this invention of these videos by you. But one of the things I'm hearing you say is, all right, it's unfortunate that we aren't able to bring people together in a concert hall and enjoy music together in the same space, which is really the most powerful way to enjoy music. But, um, by putting it out into the virtual world, you could be expanding your audiences and really bringing people into um, a love of music that they would have never had the time to sample before um, without being sequestered at home and looking for something new to do. I think it's, a, it's an opportunity. And I think um, uh, our CEO, uh, Dave Prentice, he just, uh, there was an article that was just published and he said this kind of forces arts organizations to be creative, to broaden the range of what we think our organizations can do. Um, and I think if we think about it as an opportunity, yes, it's, it's, it's sad that we can't perform the music the way that we've been performing it, but there are, it's kind of forcing us to look at things in a new way and maybe find new ways, as, uh, new ways of reaching people that we hadn't reached before. Do you think even when we get past this crisis, when life returns to whatever normal is post coronavirus, um, this approach is something that you're going to continue to do, the short videos that you put out beyond just the classroom? Yeah, I'm hooked. I'm hooked. I didn't, I didn't realize that, that, that I, I, could, I could do this, and I didn't realize that um, how much that children would appreciate the opportunity to do this just besides the time that we have with them in their schools. So I don't know why I didn't think of this before. I've already started work um, today on another series um, that um, we kind of thought about this about 10 years ago, but there was a, a way that we explored the idea of, of punctuation, the, the author's creative use of punctuation in literature and how those same types of punctuation exist in classical music. So it's called musical punctuation and I just started working on that now. That's exciting and we cannot wait. And then the last uh, question I wanted to ask, have, have you heard back from parents? Are parents saying, ah, now I get it. Now I know what you've been doing at school. <laughs> I haven't heard back directly. I know that we're reaching out to our local schools just this week to share these videos. Um, I've seen some comments um, from some people who have viewed it on, on YouTube and on our Facebook page. And I think it's a welcome opportunity. And I also think it's a, a great way to show that uh, there's different ways that we can think about music, we can think about the arts. And as somebody who might understand symmetry, um, now we're able to say, well, you do understand symmetry, so you do understand classical music. If you understand it in this aspect, then of course you understand it within the arts. And I think that's a, a powerful tool for us. And we do have one question from John Porcino, and I know that, John, I'm with you on this. This is amazing, kudos. How does one learn how to do this kind of thing? What equipment do you need? Oh, as far as to make the videos? Okay, so um, I, I use, I, I'm a Mac person, so Keynote is the same as PowerPoint. So I create the slides, the graphs, the imagery, and, and do all the animation on the Keynote um, PowerPoint um, presentation. Then I create a QuickTime screen recording of me tapping through the PowerPoint. And then I take that, power, that uh, QuickTime video, bring it into iMovie, and then I can add tracks that I've created, musical tracks that I've created on GarageBand. I can edit it. I can add in titles. And that's how the movie is then created, the video is created. So Terry, you just listed a whole bunch of different <laughs> programs. I'm wondering if you could send us an email summarizing what you just said, and we will um, post it along with this video um, for people who 
are a little slower on the uptake like I am on following all of that. Thank you so much, Terry, for being our guinea pig on our very first uh, culture chat. Um, and thank everybody who took some time out of your day to join us today. If you have ideas or if you know of somebody who's doing something resilient and agile and creative and exciting and interesting and upbeat and energizing, uh, just shoot us a, an email or a text and we would love to share these stories um, at one o'clock on any particular day of the week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Terry. You all have a good day. Take care.